Hi there. I'm going to get started. Uh, so hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Campana, Assistant Professor of Japanese Literature and Media here at Cornell University. Uh, first, a land acknowledgement. Uh, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayo Kono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayo Kono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayo Kono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayo Kono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. So thank you very much for coming to today's event, uh, Reframing Disability, Manga's Portrayals of Deaf Characters. It's wonderful to see people here from all over. I'm thrilled to welcome Professor Yoshiko Okuyama, Professor of Japanese Studies at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, a scholar of Japanese language, mythology, disability studies, and deaf studies, among many other fields. Professor Okuyama is really one of the most exciting scholars of Japanese studies today, with truly groundbreaking work uh, that stretches across multiple disciplinary frameworks. She's published two books, uh, Japanese Mythology in Film from 2015, and last year, Reframing Disability in Manga, which is a truly wonderful book based on 15 different case studies related to depictions of disability and deafness in manga, Japanese comics, and the chapter of which will be the basis of today's talk. And she also has a new book manuscript focused on manga memoirs related to disability and mental health, which I'm extremely excited for. I'm so grateful that she took the time to be with us here today and to share some of her fantastic work with us. I would also like to thank the East Asia program for hosting this event, including its director, Professor Andrea Bachner, the program manager, Joshua Young, and the program initiatives and media coordinator, Amala Lane. Thank you also to the interpreters from Sign Nexus, Stephanie Fain and Kami Malave. This event is co-sponsored by the new East Asia Plus initiative at Cornell, dedicated to interdisciplinary approaches linking together innovative digital publishing and East Asian media studies. I also want to mention the new Central New York Humanities Corridor Working Group on Global Disability Studies, which will mean that there will hopefully be many more events to come related to disability and East Asia here at Cornell. So please continue to check out the East Asia program's website and its programming, most of which continues to be online. Amala will be posting a link in the chat. Um, finally, a bit on how we're doing the Q&A today. Uh, people should feel free to ask their question in the chat at any time during the talk, and we'll hopefully get to your question during the Q&A period afterwards. Also, feel free to use the raise hand function during the Q&A period so we can call on you. And also a reminder to please uh, turn off your video now before the Q&A for better bandwidth transmission. And if there are any technical issues or accessibility issues, please direct message Amala Lane directly. And without further ado, thank you so much. And please give a warm welcome to Professor Yoshiko Okuyama. Hello, my name is Yoshiko Okuyama. As Andrew introduced me, I'm a professor of Japanese studies at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So let me share my as a pre presentation slides first. Okay, here we go. Right. So today I will share my research related to reframing disability in manga, which is my book published by the University of Hawaii Press last year. And last year, 2020 is the 30th 
anniversary of the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this month, October, is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. So to me, it is very symbolic to have this opportunity to talk about disability. And thank you very much for inviting me to your lecture series. I conducted the research in Japan as a Japan Foundation Fellow in 2017. I interviewed the manga artists, conducted archival research, and visited events and organizations serving disability communities, mainly in Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. Yeah, I visited other places, but those three places were main places. And today, I will focus on one of the book's chapter which is titled Portrayals of Deaf Characters. It is a chapter that introduces representative man manga or Japanese comics or graphic novels that portray the deaf communities in Japan. So next slide. Before delving into the chapter's content, allow me to present the current disability data to contextualize my talk. According to the United Nations most recent data published in May of 2020, 1 billion people have disabilities in the world, which is about 15% of the world population. And within that group, 80% of them live in developing countries. And women and children are particularly more vulnerable. One out of five women either currently experiencing or likely to experience some form of disability in life. One in 10 children has one or more disabilities in the world. The United Nations identifies people with disabilities as one of the most excluded groups. And they say that in in terms of the number of COVID-19 related deaths, they are among the hardest hit in the global crisis. Next slide. Now, zooming into Japan. In Japan, the government data on disability are presented in three different categories. People with physical disabilities, people with intellectual disabilities, and people with mental disabilities. Japan's cabinet office, Nae Musho, has been publishing a disability white paper, Shogai Sha Hakusho, uh, uh, annually since 1994. According to their 2021 disability white paper, around 8% of the whole population of Japan have some form of disability. By groups, 3.45% are people with physical disability, 0.87% are people with intellectual disabilities, and 3.32% are those with mental disabilities. It appears that the percentages of people with physical and mental disabilities are almost the same. However, when I looked at the increase from the data of two years ago, which is 2019, I noticed an interesting difference. Among the three, uh, three groups, the increase in the number of people with mental disability is close to 1%. The increase of the other two, two groups are only about 0.1% respectively. So I must say the almost 1% increase with mental health cases is something we should pay uh, close attention to. And these data were actually collected pre-pandemic. So now in the second year of COVID-19 restrictions, I suspect the increase is even bigger. And right now uh, I'm writing a book about mental disabilities in Japan. So this is a very intriguing uh, outcome. Next slide. An important note on language use. 
the Japanese word for people with disability is shogaisha. It has such connota well, negative connotations though. For example, shogai means obstacle. So shogaisha literally means obstacle person. So I would like to propose that we use a different term, a term tojisha. Tojisha is a term referring to a person directly affected by the, con the condition, whatever the condition is. And people with disabilities themselves don't call, don't call themselves shogaisha. They call themselves tojisha. So it's a more positive, progressive way to refer, refer to them and by themselves. The word tojisha was originally a legal term. It began to be used in reference to the membership of a minority group, especially during their minority rights movement in the 1980s. But it is um, actually an all-inclusive term. It's kind of vague, and it does not just mean people with disability per, per se. But in this particular context, in today's lecture talk, um, I think tojisha works. And most importantly, Tojisha is a reference used by people with lived experience of disability. So I would like to stick to the use of the term in this lecture. Next slide. Now, book overview. My book, Reframing Disability in Manga, features recent manga titles that portray Tojisha with authenticity and cast them as the main characters, not the side character or villain or super creep. A super creep is a term used in disability studies in reference to a disabled superhero or heroine. I presented selected manga titles in each of five representative conditions. And these manga cast everyday tojisha individuals in title roles without being forcing a super creep uh, model or other stereotypes. These manga offer insight into a variety of issues affecting the tojisha population of Japan. So these mangas are quite different from the older generation of manga, particularly ones published before the 1990s in Japan. Next slide. Uh, media and disability has representational issues. From ancient folklore to contemporary media, Tojisha characters have been typically presented as the other. This trope of otherness contains negative characteristics such as strange, bizarre, or exotic. And they are often represented as non-human entities, such as monsters. And they are associated with some kinds of danger to society. But it's not just Japan, of course. Uh, US comics, for example. In the 1970s, Marvel and DC comics portrayed Tojisha characters with stereotypes such as a disfigured individual that deserves our sympathy or a psychotic villain. And the real life representation of disability related issues was, was non-existent according to some US comic analysts. Now, back in manga. In manga, that trend continued up until the 1990s. It was only during the early 1990s when Tojisha characters in manga began to be depicted more accurately and also cast as the main characters of the stories. Without disparaging language, without super creep or villain typecast or even obscure sub, uh, sub character roles. Unfortunately though, some manga continue to misrepresent the Tojisha protagonist with ableist uh, views and stereotypes. So today, I will compare two manga titles, Gangster and 
a silent voice using several sample images that feature deaf main characters very differently. Next slide. Gangsta. A Gangsta is an eight volume series published in a CNN magazine for adult male readers. In this story, two male assassins live in an imagined US city, which is probably uh, Los Angeles. Warwick is hearing and wears a patch over his left eye. He's quite, he is quite skillful at shooting with his gun. And then Nicholas or Nick is a deaf character with black hair who fights with a sword. Next slide. In this manga, Nick is portrayed in the typical super creep model, like the iconic Zatoichi, if you know, the blind sword master, very popular in Japanese pop, uh, popular culture. As image one shows, Nick is drawn to display his superhuman speed and agility. He is also depicted to be using amazing swordsman uh, swordsmanship in many battle scenes. An image two is one example in which Nick is portrayed as a man of few words. And in this first panel, Warwick, Nick's partner, Warwick is not good at cooking. And he said, Nick always looked puzzled when eating the meal I fixed. Well, what's that supposed to mean? You know, it's as if Nick doesn't question and accept whatever is given to him, right? Well, as such, in this manga, the Tojisha character lacks agency, except when he is fighting. Next slide. Um, image three shows Nick signing with Warwick. In the pan panel I circle, Nick's fluency of signing is implied with the onpu or Japanese uh, or manga effect in manga, uh, man uh, effect, sound effect in manga. So onpu, pu, pa, pa, drawn above his moving hand. The translation of Nick's signed message is presented in white text on a black background to distinguish from hearing character speech. But there is no sign to word correspondence. And although created, pa pa, it's not a realistic way of representing sign language. And perhaps uh, the author chose to do so because Nick uses unidentified sign language. We don't know if it's ASL or JSL or whatever. And the, but the, the fact is that in this manga, neither the deaf character nor his signing is given a fair representation. And in image four, two police officers are whispering behind Nick and one agent is saying to the other, Nick, has, uh, he, he has sharp eyes to compensate for his ears. Then he goes on to say, be careful, this guy can read lips. When you tell us, tell me a secret, cover your mouth. So the implication to me is like, Nick can pose a danger to, a hear, to hearing individuals through his impeccable lip reading. And to me, it is an ableist representation of deaf characters. So with all these misgivings, Youngster not only fails to help the reader to understand the real life deaf community, but also adds stereotypes about being deaf. Next slide. By contrast, a silent voice, a recent mega hit manga, portrays the main deaf character not as a super creep, but as a real human being. Originally serialized in a, a CNN magazine for young male uh, readers, this manga depicts communication in JSL, Japanese Sign Language, very authentically. A silent voice, or koe no katachi in the original Japanese title, 
which means a uh, vo voice shape. This came out as an anime for English language viewers. So some of them, some of you already know, but for those who are not familiar with this story, here is a plot. The story revolves around two young protagonists. One is a hearing boy, the other a deaf girl. Shoko is a deaf sixth grader transferred to Shoya's class. And trying to get classmates' attention, Shoya, a hearing boy, begins to bully Shoko. Well, he's not the only one doing so in, uh, in this manga, but he's a ringleader nonetheless. Then Shoya's cl classmates austerocizes him as a bully. So thereafter, Shoya takes on a personal journey of redemption, learns to sign in JSL, and six years later, as a, as a high school senior, Shoya reunites with Shoko. Next slide. Image one shows the young protagonist Shoya as a sixth grader, a sixth grade boy who would resort to violence and domination in solving problems, and also to avoid boredom, according to the character's own words. He is immature and out of control. That's when he meets Shoko, a deaf girl. In image two, you see Shoko's writing. I can't hear. Watch how Shoya catches the word here. To him, that signifies a difference between this girl and himself. Then he conceptualizes Shoko as the other. Now, image three, a double page spread that provides a panoramic view to the reader. This emphasizes the moment in which Shoya visualizes Shoko as someone from outer space. Shoko becomes something that does not belong to his species, his mankind. And then actually on the page right after this scene, Shoya blots out a weirdo in the classroom. So volume one basically present the prejudice and discrimination that hearing people like Shoya tend to hold against the Tojisha. Next slide. By contrast, volume two and the rest of the manga feature Shoko and Shoya as high school seniors and they are signing. A former bully Shoya is now maturing and desires to reconnect with Shoko. And as I said before, he has learned to sign in JSL. Image four shows Shoya signing to forget, telling uh, Shoko the notebook he's holding is what she left at school in sixth grade. Um, in manga, it's hard to see a dementia though. Uh, your hands, it's supposed to go behind your ear to sign, to forget, but you get the gist of it, right? And then image five illustrates Shoko signing necessarily and happy, which is translated in Shoya's thought bubble. You are happy when you are needed, huh? And sometimes the sign message is presented with a single, single sign to highlight what's important, like image six. And in that image, image six, Shoya's hands are shaped for the JSL sign, friends. And he's vocalizing his message, can we become friends as shown in his speech balloon. Next slide. I have several examples to show how creatively sign language communication is represented in this manga. Image seven presents Shogo's message through Shoya's thought bubble. And uh, so it's like as if the reader can see what he's thinking or processing. And like image eight, 
the sign message is sometimes it presented directly in the field. So from Shoya's perspective, right? And then this in this message, Shoko is signing. How did you learn to how did you learn to the uh, I'm sorry, how did you learn the sign language? And only sign is drawn in the in the, the image. In image nine, both characters are in the same frame. And now the manga assumes the, the reader's perspective. Then the signed message, see you again, is shown in a circle as if the, the reader has full access to their conversation. Next slide. As, as you can see in the middle, the regular speech balloon in comic has a tail indicating from whom the message is coming. Now watch image 10, in which Shoko is signing to Shoya. On each panel, a single sign, or one time a, sing, a sign sequence, is translated in a, a bubble without a tail. So it seems like the reader has direct access to their signed messages. As Shoko says, um, I, I, I was thinking, thinking of the same thing um, and to, together, let's do our best, right? And then Shoya agrees, yeah. So neither one is vocalizing their messages. They communicate simply through handshakes as the title suggests, you know, koe no katachi, right? So I thought it's a very neat way of showing their conversation visually. By contrast, images 11 and 12 frame Shoko signed messages using quotation marks. The balloon in image 11 shows her sign, happy in quotation. And the image 12 shows her long sign messages just in quotation. And this indicate that there is a third party interpreting Shoko and Shoya's JSL conversation through a hearing person. Um, in fact, in this scene, that third person is Shoko's sister, Yuzuru. And Yuzuru is interpreting for uh, Shoya's friend who is watching the couple from the, the window. So like this, the author Oima Yoshitoki used a variety of manga strategies to represent the signed messages in her manga. And incidentally, her mother is a real life sign language uh, interpreter. So if you teach a course related to disability studies, I believe this is a great material to use. Uh, by the way, I have a file called Manga Glossary. So if you uh, like to use some manga related terminology, uh, that file has all, almost all like onpu and manpu and kidashi uh, and so forth. So I'll be happy to uh, share the, uh, the file with you. Okay, next slide. So deaf community friendly manga like this did not just happen. In the 1990s, the, pi the pioneer comics featuring deaf characters were written by Yamamoto Osamu and Karube Junko, who paved the path for the millennium the manga like Silent, uh, Silent Voice. Yamamoto's manga stories are serialized in the CNN manga magazine. Uh, CNN refers to the comics for adult male readers. And, the, and his uh, works depicted deaf people and their families and teachers as central figures. In his works, the character's sign communication is visually and properly represented. And Kalube Junko's comic series is, the, is the, just the same. And her series was serialized in a shoujo manga magazine, Mimi, for teenage, uh, teenagers and older female readers. And both authors' comics became quite popular and were made into other uh, forms of popular, uh, popular culture, such as TV drama. 
uh, both authors learn Shua, which means sign language in Japanese, at their local Shua circles. They receive awards from the manga industry for their contributions. Next slide. Well, by now you may wonder why these pioneer works were published and became popular, particularly in the 1990s, right? Well, here is a quick social background prior to that time. First, in the 1960s to 70s, the general public did not understand how deaf people lived, how they communicated, or what their needs were in Japan. That absence of knowledge and awareness was naturally reflected in manga. And according to Nagai, a uh, manga critic, who is also deaf, uh, deaf characters in those old manga were more likely to end up being physically abused and committed suicide and meeting uh, another tragedy. Um, but, but in the early 1990s, that trend in the manga, manga industry changed tremendously. Well, what happened? It, 1981 was proclaimed by the UN as the International Year of Dis Disabled People. In Japan, people became more aware of the basic human right, which is the right to live a good life, regardless of one's uh, gender, race, or any other differences. Also in 1992, the governments of the Asia and Pacific region, including Japan, proposed to designate the next 10 years as the Asian and Pacific decade of disabled persons. Um, in 1993, Japan's disability law which was established in 1970, was finally revised and renamed as the basic law for persons with dis disabilities. By the way, that law finally included the category of mental disability. And around that time, the manga industry was still very hesitant to approve any project that focused on disability. In, uh, but in 1988, that taboo was broken by Yamamoto's Far Off Koshien Stadium manga, which was published as a comic book in 1992. In the same year, 1992, Karube Junko's Your Hands Are Whispering, that her manga came out as a comic book. So thanks to these pioneer deaf manga, deaf tojisha characters are now represented with authenticity. Unfortunately though, as I demonstrated today, we still have manga that struggle with the stereotypical representation of deaf tojisha. Uh, just a quick note, uh, you see that the image uh, on this screen, right? Yeah, that's taken from Yamamoto's manga about uh, Yamamoto's manga titled My Finger Orchestra. And that manga is about Osaka City School for the Deaf. Uh, for those who are particularly interested in the history of deaf communities in Japan, right? Um, after the Milan Conference in Italy in 1880, Many schools for the deaf, including the deaf, uh, school for the deaf in Japan, switched to the oral method. And uh, in Japan, particularly early in the 1900s, they switched to the oral method. But there, is, there was one school that refused to do so. That was Osaka City School for the Deaf. And its principal, Takahashi Kiyoshi, uh, the, the, the man you see in the image, um, is the, was a leading force. And actually, and there will be a new film coming out uh, next year about 
Mr. Takahashi. So that will be interesting to watch. Okay, next slide. So now we are in the middle of the almost two year long pandemic. This situation has affected us all, of course, including Tojisha in various ways. So to end my talk from a global perspective, I would like to show a short video from the WHO website. And its title is Leave Us Not Behind. And perhaps it's a resonance to one of the disability activist, activism models, nothing about us without us. Well, maybe not. But anyway, the video tells us how the world Tojisha, a uh, world Tojisha population has been hit hard by the pandemic. And especially if you are, your academic interests in disability go beyond, <clears throat> beyond deaf communities, this is a good video to use in your class, I thought. And um, one more thing, uh, I would like to remind you that December 3rd is the International Day of Persons with Disability. So I thought it would be good to resource to share with you. And I have one more URL in chat. So you will see both, uh, both videos URL in chat. And uh, that, the second one is the UNESCO's message about the International Day of Persons with Disability. So I hope you can make use of this. Um, so after watching the WHO video, I will, uh, we will proceed to the Q&A session, I believe. So thank you very much for listening to my lecture today. And I will show you the short video, video which is less than four minutes. And I, around that time, it's probably a good time for me to catch my breath and also for you to kind of, uh, you know, form your uh, questions yeah, for the, the Q&A session. So if you'd like to share your comment, uh, comments or questions directly with me, here is my uh, email. And that will be also in, the, in chat, I believe. So here is the, the video. Six hundred and ninety million persons with disabilities in Asia Pacific already excluded before COVID-19. The disability community faces new normals. COVID-19 is our new reality. I can't afford to get infected. COVID-19 infection means certain death for me. No money, no food, no medicine, no soap. Everything stopped. What if my parents died? This lockdown has been so difficult for Naim who has autism. He has broken his iPad and his keyboard just because of this. COVID-19 information for the public is not always made accessible to persons with disabilities, especially those of us who rely on the use of computer screen reading software. Persons with psychosocial disabilities who are institutionalized are at much greater risk. They have access to a very few amount of information. All health systems are stretched. Tough call, who to save and who to let die. We have crippling expenses and empty coffers. It is now so difficult to raise funds. Adapt to thrive. In Bangladesh, CDD and many other organizations of persons with disabilities distribute relief packages, create awareness and promote teletherapy in community for our fellow persons with disabilities. But the good thing is that we have a long-term partnership with the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief and they have issued this directive to all district commissioners to implement disability-inclusive COVID-19 responses.
We use Filipino sign language. When COVID-19 started, the media did not have sign language interpretation. We deaf persons broke information barriers. Now we have sign language interpretation for the news. We relay medical consultations and information with easy to understand infographics. We hope to partner with our government and experts for sustainable, accessible sign language communication systems. In the new reality, we must adapt to new normals. Every line matters. We are 618 million. We are fought. Leave us not behind. Leave us. Not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Let us not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Leave us not behind. Thank you so much, Professor Okuyama, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to now open things up for the Q&A. Uh, please feel free to either put your question in the chat, uh, and I will ask the question on your behalf, or to use the raise hand function, and then we could call on you and you could ask your question directly. Um, for the first question, I'm going to uh, read out uh, Brenda Schertz's question, which is really maybe the key question when thinking about a silent voice, which is, were deaf people asked about their perspectives on the deaf characters in the film uh, and manga, A Silent Voice? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Well, were the, um, the deaf people asked to share their perspective on the manga, as well as the uh, uh, anime, the, the adaptation, right? Okay. Um, as far as I know, well, as I mentioned, the, the you know the author, uh, manga author, mother is a professional sign interpreter. So definitely, she helps her uh, gain the, the, the deaf community's perspective. But I don't know if she, uh, if the author directly discussed the content with any particular deaf uh, organization or represent, representatives. However, okay, this is what I found out by interviewing, uh, you know, a manga, art, art, manga artists in Japan. Um, those publishers, manga publishers, uh, have occasional, you know, seminars and the presentation workshops for manga authors to raise their awareness about social issues, including disabilities. And their uh, work uh, was really scrutinized before they were uh, you know, okay to be published. The company, the manga publishing companies, they really examined the content so that we don't, uh, they don't have to offend any related uh, minority groups, right? So definitely uh, there must have been some kind of negotiation where, you know, uh, the, the study research done before uh, Oima Imatoki's work was put in, in the public. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to first read out a comment in the chat and then a question. The comment is from Yuru Chen, who says, it was such a meaningful presentation. Thank you, Yoshiko and all the ASL interpreters. I also noticed that in the Chinese deaf community, some have concerns about the personality slash behaviors portrayed in a silent voice and think of them as inauthentic, regardless of the use of JSL. I think this will definitely lead to further conversations. And I'm going to uh, ask a question that Kirk Van Gilder posted in the chat. 
wondering if the presence of deaf and disabled people in manga and anime is changing perceptions of people in Japan toward deaf and disabled lives. Or is it a unique market thing that has become a trend in plots, i.e. our decisions to play up the blind sister in Miss Hokusai when going from manga to anime, an inclusion move, or something done to capitalize on popular trends that viewers come to see? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very interesting question. I think that's probably both way, you know. Um, of course, manga, what I'm, I'm not saying that manga was the only force to change people's awareness about disability communities, including deaf communities, right? So there were already pre precedents, you know, the, uh, the minority activism in the 1980s and so forth. So all the in sequences and then mangas, uh, manga uh, artists, um, started to pay more attention to those uh, groups and they incorporated the, uh, those characters into their storytelling, right? right. And then uh, publishers probably saw um, marketability as well. Yeah, so now the, the general public is more interested in, let's say, uh, mental disabilities. So the uh, manga, uh, manga artists are actually encouraged to write about mental disability like this, right? So I think, you know, it comes both ways. It, there would be a good collaboration between, you know, the activism, aw increased awareness, and then, you know, marketability that publishers uh, see according to that. So did I answer uh, the, the question? Well, if there is any part um, I missed to comment on, please let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think you covered what was in the question. Um, continuing on in the chat, uh, I want to point to a comment by Marcella Davies, in which they, Davis, in which they say, uh, JSL still practice in NYC, but they are hidden like hidden gems, pointing to the fact that JSL is truly a global community of speakers of Japanese sign language, and, uh, and it's not just a phenomenon in Japan alone, I think. Um, Ji Hao Lin asks, Hi, Professor Okuyama. Many thanks for this informative talk. I wonder if you have followed the deaf or disabled people who have entered the manga industry and played a part in it as authors, producers, or any other creative roles. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. As far as I noticed, there is only one deaf manga artist. And he published his, uh, you know, his stories in the manga, uh, in the digital manga format, I believe, and uh, it didn't gather his works, didn't gather so much attention. But at least, as I am aware of one um, deaf manga artist, and then in terms of other forms of involvement in the production of uh, deaf-related manga or disability uh, manga, yeah, well. I just, in terms of deaf uh, individuals, uh, I don't know any one person to name in particular. But when we go outside of the deaf community and deaf manga, well, for example, a manga about the blind characters. Right? Uh, I know one uh, scholar who is involved in, uh, who was involved in the production of uh, uh, manga about deaf people, and of, he uh, he was hired as a consultant. Thanks very much, and uh, it definitely points. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and then one thing I just I just realized that right, uh, probably uh, you know it's not just manga, but the anime version of a silent voice. Right, I remember hearing that uh, the. The deaf uh, uh, deaf community, I mean, uh, deaf organizations, uh, originally were upset about the infrequency of uh, captions, <laughs> captioned uh, film of a silent voice shown in Japan, and so they negotiated the uh, presentation time and so forth because it's about you know it shows 
it features the deaf character, main character, and why you know excluded deaf audiences, right? It didn't make any sense. So they correct the, the anime production uh, uh, producer corrected that mistake. Thank you very much. And uh, these questions and your answers really do point to the important reality of the continued discrimination against deaf and disabled people in Japanese pop culture industries, but also the opportunities that are opening up. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of activity in the Japanese deaf communities, especially within filmmaking, dance, and theater. I'm going to put a link in the chat to a really interesting film from 2016 called Listen or Risun by two deaf filmmakers uh, who about sign language music. Their names are Eri Makihara and Dake. Um, type that out. Uh, and so there's definitely a rich universe of deaf created Japanese cultural products, but uh, a silent voice had such prominence. Um, I'm going to continue on with questions in the chat. Uh, Monique Holt asked a similar question. Are there any deaf or other disabled manga artists out there? Which I think you've covered in your last answer. Um, next is Eileen Vo, who asks, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I was wondering if you can provide us with more information about the history of JSL. Oh, great, great question. Uh, well, honestly, to understand the history of deaf communities in Japan, the best book to read is Karen Nakamura's Deaf in Japan. And it has, you know, the sections and, and the chapters of deaf history. But just for the synopsis, well, as far as I, I understand, um, deaf school, the first school for the deaf was founded in Kyoto in 18, uh, late 18. Um, 1875 uh, or something, right? And then after that, uh, that be, the school uh, also included the blind. So the, the first uh, school for the deaf and blind was founded in Kyoto. And then after that, there are many more de schools for the deaf and the deaf for, and the blind as well, like all over Japan. But, um, as I said before, you know, they were originally encouraging students to communicate and they, they were forming their sign language communication and their refined sign styles and so forth. But after the Milan conference in 1880s, right, uh, because of that Western influence and also pressure from the Japanese government those schools felt needed to change to the oral, you know, education, and uh, they don't accept only one school in Osaka. Yeah, they changed the, the, the you know, the educational styles there, but it's not much difference. And then, you know, uh, up until recently, uh, still majority of the school teachers were signing not their real JSL, but you know, the signed Japanese, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like a pidgin version of uh, Japanese sign language and so forth. And only quite recently that trend changed. So in, uh, we have one yeah, private school, which is totally, bilingual, you know, just the natural the Japanese sign language and uh, the English, uh, written English uh, communication, right? So that's one in uh, Meisei Gakuen in Tokyo. And then um, other public schools for the deaf are, were strongly encouraging teachers to use real sign, Japanese sign language in, in regular instructions, yeah. So I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you so much for that really concise and great history of JSL. Um, moving on in the chat to a two-part question from Yuan Shui Jing. She asks, hi, Professor Okuyama. Thank you so much for the amazing lecture. I noticed that Gangsta is a seinen manga. In other words, a manga meant largely for adult men. And Silent Voice is a shonen manga for boys and young men. 
Do you think that to some extent, specific genres of manga are consuming deaf people? And the second part is, besides, can we say that in some manga, deafness is reduced to an element, according to Azuma Hiroki's database theory? To clarify, Azuma Hiroki's database theory is this idea that in Japanese pop culture, many characters aren't consumed as full-on characters, but just based on their elements, you know, the color of their hair, the, that they wear glasses or not. So in, 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 she's asking, I think, is deafness sometimes reduced to just another trait of characters that may make them attractive or interesting rather than become an actual uh, accurate depiction of them? So that's a two-parter there. Okay, great. So let me respond to the first question. Right. Uh, the first one is a genre. Any particular genre is more deaf manga friendly or disability manga friendly, right? Um, the silent voice is just, well, as I understand, the difference, one of the elements that makes the difference in genre is uh, content of violence and sexual you know, material. So gangster definitely has to be for older male readers because of all the action, you know, scenes and so forth, brutal killings and stuff, right? So uh, yeah, it doesn't doesn't mean that they uh, the author neglected the disability focus just because of the particular genre, and then by contrast, you know. Uh, the the uh, the author of a silent voice um is is also um well immersed in shoujo manga you know the manga made for women uh for girls and uh, older women I mean, so uh, teenage girls and uh, the little older women um so uh, coming from that background you know she had the element of romance but not without any sexual connotation. So that is, that's why the target readers were, uh, say, uh, you know, seinen uh, manga. Then why not sh a shoujo manga for women? Why, why shonen? Why young, why young boys, right? Well, nowadays, that genre specification is really more, uh, you know, blurry. And especially uh, topics with social importance, such as disability or discrimination. And in this manga in particular, bullying, right? Right, so those are the, are the stories with such social significance are, are are more likely to be marketed to the the, gen, uh, the readers with the you know um, with the, uh, the 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 male uh, audiences because traditionally male readers tend to focus on the, the what they like you know, very narrow uh, interests compared to female readers. Female readers are said to have a little bit more diverse interest, but male readers tend to read, you know, the uh, sports magazine, a sports um, genre, or, you know, like uh, gambling or, you know, Yakuza type manga. But, you know, in order to create awareness in society, right, that important message has to be shared with as many the different audiences as possible. So I think it's, there is a publisher's intention behind, you know, to market to the the sene, I mean, uh, to the, the younger boys there. Well, uh, I mean, with the, the silent voice, but with Gangster, I don't think the publisher had that type of intention. I don't think the publisher wanted to use that manga to increase the awareness of deaf characters, no, 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 right. So that I think that, that that's you know origin of the story is uh, has a big role to play. And then for the second question, uh, yeah, I understand that you know uh, sometimes characters with disabilities are reduced to that disability symbolism of disability 
was per se, right? Or element. Um, and they, this manga, to some extent, has that, yeah, so uh, that implication. So I didn't say this in my lecture, but the reason I didn't choose that, that manga assigning voice, well, there are a few, a few reasons. One of the reasons is, you know, um, the main topic, the theme of this manga is bullying, right? not the particularly a, a disability community. And I also think, you know, Shoko, the deaf girl's um, agency is kind of reduced. And it, the manga does not really introduce how uh, Shoko interacts with other deaf uh, people, right? So that's in, in these regards, that manga, A Silent Voice, has more like an edimen the type of, you know, approach compared to those uh, pioneer manga I, manga titles I analyzed in my book. So that was the reason why, why I didn't, those are the reasons why I didn't choose to analyze the silent voice. But to, for uh, uh, this lecture, I chose it because I assume that more people are uh, aware, uh, uh, familiar with that anime version of it, right? And that was, that is quite popular in the United States. And several of my students were talking about that too. So I thought it's more approachable. So I hope I answer the questions, but if there is any element I left out, please let me know. Thanks very much. Uh, and on that note, I want to uh, read out uh, some comments that are follow up to earlier points related to what you just said. Uh, Brenda Schertz has followed up saying, thank you for mentioning about accurate portrayal of deaf people in manga. Most people might think it's a, it is a positive thing to portray deaf characters in manga, yet in the film, A Silent Voice, the deaf character is portrayed as a lonely and isolated girl, which is an old stereotype of deaf people. There were no other deaf characters. Usually deaf people socialize with other deaf people, but that was not shown at all in the silent voice. For that reason, I was curious if culturally deaf people in Japan was consulted on the film. And uh, Leanne responds to Brenda directly saying that, that remember that deaf people aren't a monolith. There's a variety of experiences. Some deaf people, especially mainstreamed ones like Shoko, where she's the only deaf student at school, don't have the opportunity to make deaf friends. Many deaf people have that experience as children and later grow up as adults to make deaf friends. That was my experience as well. So that was an interesting exchange in the comments. Um, I'm going to go back up to the questions. And uh, the next question in, in the queue is uh, Yan Liu who asks, thank you for your terrific presentation, Professor Okuyama. I am curious about the category of intellectual disability in Japan. Can you say a bit more about that category and its portrayal in manga? Uh, intellectual disability, all right. Category of intellectual disability. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Andrew, can you specify that? Well, so the question, I, I haven't pinpointed the question in chat. So oh, that's yes, a, uh, a bit more about the portrayal. Oh, sorry. Uh, a bit more about the portrayal of intellectual disability in Japan in particular and how that category is constructed. Okay, all right. So as far as I can recall, just off the bat, um, two, there are two big, um, big manga that feature the protagonist with intellectual disability. One is with the light, uh, the Hikari to Tomoni, and the other one is uh, uh, Daisuke Yuzuru no uh, Kosodate Nikki. So Daisuke, like, uh, I don't, it hasn't been translated into English yet, but if I would, then that would be that I love it. And uh, this is Yuzuru's, uh, Yuzuru's uh, Yuzuki, kana? Um, the, and uh, uh, parenting, parenting uh, the diary. So these two have attracted a lot of attention, a lot of attention from Japanese readers and uh, how they are constructed in terms of disability, uh, intellectual disability. The first one I cited uh, with the light, that focuses on uh, the autism, the a child with autism and uh, uh, the mother, well, actually the protagonist is 
not only the child, but also the mother. And mother struggles to uh, gain understanding from her relatives, especially her mother in law and uh, who is critical of uh, her giving birth to a child with a uh, disability. And then uh, she also struggles to find support from schools and so forth. So it is really, uh, uh, I believe, a very accurate rendition of how mothers uh, with, with uh, children with intellectual disability go through within the school system in Japan uh, and also community, as well as in interaction with their relatives. In Japan, we still have some archaic um, biases or the, even the superstitions about disabilities. You know, if you your child is born with a disability, maybe it's a curse from their previous life and so forth. And there are relatives who would say that, who would word that, that type of superstition. So those kind of things are also uh, portrayed, portrayed in that manga with the light. And then second one, um, you, Daisuki Yuzuru no Kosodate Niki. I just, I haven't read the, the whole series myself. So I don't know, but uh, it was, it became so popular. It, they, NHK made a, a drama series, I, I believe. So, uh, so far I haven't come, up, um, come across any, you know, repercussion from the, the, the groups, uh, groups representing intellectual disability. So I think that it was well received. Thanks very much. Uh... For the next question in the chat, uh, Luis asks, Hello, Professor Okuyama. Thank you for the presentation regarding disability in manga. What does the Japanese government, does the Japanese government have any mangaka, manga artist programs to support disabled communities in Japan that are interested in the arts and storytelling? Ah, that's an interesting question. Uh, any governmental support for manga artists with disabilities, right? Um, that I, as far as I know, there is no particular program that with that in. However, the the government, uh, the, uh, the the Japanese government has, um, I think, Max Monbusho has an outlet where uh, which recognizes uh, impactful inspirational and impactful manga for uh, with awards so government is involved in recognizing progressive manga stories that cast light on disability but it's not just on disability it's just you know any any manga with groundbreaking uh, insights and the influential, you know, messages. Right? So, um, but uh, any uh, program, uh, particularly to support uh, manga artists to produce manga about disability or you know, a manga artists with disabilities, I don't know any, any. But it will be, yeah, it will be excellent because there are much fewer number of artists, you know, like, like the disability mo model, right? Nothing about us without us. So we need to really encourage uh, people with disabilities, you know, uh, to produce their own perspectives in the art form, in the manga art form. Thanks very much. Um, so the next question in the chat is from Michael Rembis, who asks, thank you for your wonderful presentation and book. So important. Very much looking forward to your future work. I am curious, do deaf people identify as disabled in Japan? Is there anything analogous to the capital D deaf culture in Japan? Ah, oh, good question, right. And once again, I have to, I have to cite uh, Karen Nakamura's book, Deaf in Japan, right? So, because that features all the transitions Japanese deaf individual went through from the just regular D to capital D movement and so forth. So you can read in detail, in much detail about that, the you know, activism and transitions and so forth in the book, Karen Nakamura's book. 
Yeah, but just to answer your question, well, you know, uh, whether they recognize being deaf as disability is a kind of double edged sword. Well, not double, but it's as kind of multiple implications, I should say. Right. So, for one thing, right, they do that people with, uh, I mean, deaf people do receive uh, what we call the disability passport. And with that passport, they can, you know, ride the, the public transportation uh, with discount, and there are lots of benefits, right? So they apply, right? And in order to apply, they have to identify themselves with, uh, with that disability category, right? Um, but uh, in terms of, you know, their awareness, their self identities, right? there are deaf leaders who really just like. You know, uh, deaf leaders in the United States who identify themselves with just a different culture, different group, different language speakers, not as a disability group, right? So uh, it depends on the person, of course, right? And then uh, Japan, uh, in Japan, there is a, a, a big uh, deaf community, uh, deaf organization, Japan, uh, Japan. Uh, Federation of Deaf. They have a different, they have, their members have different ideas from those who have progressive ideas and identify themselves as their own culture group, right? So we can, I cannot just speak for one group uh, per se, but uh, what, what, as I said before, if you like to know diff, those different groups and different ideas, and different identities of deaf individuals, definitely um, uh, check out Karen Nakamura's Deaf in Japan. Thanks so much for your answer. Um, and we have one more question in the chat. Uh, that's from Shanshan Oyang, who asks, thank you for your presentation, Professor Okuyama. I'm interested in queer culture. Do you know any manga about LGBT people with disabilities? So I don't recognize LGBTQ, of course, as that category, right? So you you are asking LGBTQ plus group with uh, um, you know medically recognized disability, like a mental disability or physical disability, and so forth. So, forth. so do I know any uh, any group um, in Japan mm. or any uh, manga about people? who oh, are both any, queer and disabled, for example. There are a lot of mangas about, you know, queer background, of course, in Japan, but uh, just from the top of my head, I can't think of any manga titles that, that look at both LGBTQ and uh, a, a recognized disability uh, typically recognize disability, like a physical disability per se. So, ah, okay, wait, wait, I take it back. There is one, one manga I recently came across, but I can't remember uh, the title. But in, in that manga, the, the protagonist is, is uh, gay and also has a speech impairment. So he has a stuttering, I think. Um, Right, speech impairment. But it's there is no one genre. That there, I don't think uh, there is not critical critical mass to create a genre for that. Thank you. And uh, I could think of one more example in the chat. It's called a manga called "I Hear the Sunspot," which is a uh, about two gay male characters, one of whom is hard of hearing, and uh, that's an interesting example. But yeah, ah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, yeah, I, I know that one too, right? Mm -hmm. But it's definitely not a huge trend, like you say. Right. Um, I think uh, in the chat, that's almost it. Um, I have one question myself, just to take the advantage of this time. Uh, many of my deaf friends in Japan told me that there's some relationship between manga and JSL, for example, uh, JSL slang, slang, where you can sign sound effects across your body, sort of in a manga style. So I was interested to hear your thoughts on sort of 
uh, this relationship between the manga medium and JSL more generally, and not just in its portrayal in these two works. I see. So the manga media and JSL. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, um, as I mentioned in the lecture, uh, those two manga, uh, I mean, those two manga artists, Yama, Yamamoto and Karube, um, their works really portrayed the specific sign signing, right? Um, sign representations. And uh, uh, and it, so it's this uh, the the sign and voice. But any specific collaboration, mm, I'm not really sure how to approach that question. Yeah. So it's if uh, any development between the two. Yeah, I haven't. Mm, right now, I can't think of anything. I'm sorry, but maybe, you know, if, if we exchange email addresses, <laughs> I may be able to come up with some ideas or uh, I mean, I, I may remember something and then right. I can respond later. But right now, mm, I don't really uh, have anything to oh, uh, share. That's totally fine. But I also want to use this as an opportunity to direct people to some of your excellent past work on uh, on deaf teens in Japan and their use of text messaging. Uh, I, you've written some really done really some really interesting research on that. So, using new media, new technologies uh, in, in innovative ways. So, thank you so much for not just this book, but for your vast amounts of past work. Um, we have time for one more question, perhaps, if anyone wants to add in the chat or raise their hand. Um, but if there is no more questions, I think uh, Professor Okuyama has uh, had a very intense couple of hours. So I just wanted to wish her a very warm thank you for a really wonderful talk. Uh, thank you so much for your really fascinating uh, lecture and your answers to the very extensive Q&A. And thank you to the audience for your attention and your great questions. And thank you to the two interpreters for your wonderful work. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much.